what we're trying to do with this program, and it follows on from what Francis Glesner Lee put together in the beginning, was to give police officers an orientation to the way medical examiners view death investigation. The seminar is a full week-long program, and it's an opportunity for forensic pathologists to be able to take a group of almost 50 police officers and take them through a death investigation program very much from the medical side so that they get an opportunity to learn the way forensic pathologists and medical death investigators think. And when they're going through the investigation, interviewing witnesses, they can really evaluate the information they've got with a lot more clarity. My understanding is that when Francis Glesner Lee identified this gap in the training and the resources for law enforcement, she threw herself wholeheartedly into that process and endowed the Harvard Medical School with enough money for them to have a chair of medical legal medicine. And at some point along the way, she decided that she was going to take this on the road, so to speak, and start holding her own seminars specifically for law enforcement. And so the Harvard Associates in Police Science seminar series was started. I've read where that's supposed to be like an old investigator saying somewhere. That's how I think they got to be called nutshells. And or the fact that they are small, they are miniature, they're power packed, and the truth lies there. And it could be that even that truth in a nutshell. Uh, basically, I'm the nutshell man. I'm the one with the secrets. I know the solutions to all the nutshells. Also, on the seminars, I'm the one who assigns the, um, the nutshells to the various groups. All right, here we are uh, at the end of the day. We are here, what I would think is probably the, the more interesting or the more enjoyable block, um, that's going to be the case assignments, um, where we assign the nutshells to various groups and that you have the opportunity to work them during the week and then come back on Thursday and to give a report, you know, by your group. They're basically a composite of actual crimes that occurred that Francis Glessner Lee was able to put into a model format. They are built on a one inch to one foot scale. So as you go in there, you gotta picture yourself if you're a six foot investigator, you know, you're now six inches and try to emerge yourself into those models. It's not a whodunit. So it's not, the purpose is not to solve them as much as it's more to look at indirect evidence that would be medical in nature. On the surface, Robert and Kate Judson had it all. A cozy home, a new baby, and Bob's steady paycheck. On October 31st, just before going to bed, Kate Judson set the table for her family's morning breakfast. She had every intention of waking up the next morning. But she never did. Or if she did wake up, it was for just one brief, terrifying moment. Something in this house doesn't add up. This window's open slightly right here in the front. You see it? Mm -hmm. What's it say about that? Well, there's a sewing machine right in front of the window. It's, you know, not disturbed. It's pretty heavy. Chairs aren't out of place like they use them to step up on. There's no signs of forced entry in either door. The sewing machine doesn't look disturbed at all, right? No. Nope. The chair's pulled out from the sewing machine like somebody just got done sewing and got up and walked away. So. There's a pool of blood in the baby's room. Chair's knocked down. There's a sign of a struggle. With maybe. Room. Drag marks, blood coming from the baby's room into the kitchen. When you first look at this model, you have to look at the premise and say, could this be a triple homicide? Could this be a suicide double homicide? The one thing you're sure, it's not a natural. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, didn't happen naturally. So now you know you're dealing with a, a certain kind of death. And you have to go through, again, looking at the various clues, looking at what's presented and what information you may need through an autopsy that may clear up exactly what may have happened. Most people are absolutely fascinated by them, bearing in mind that they were designed for police officers in training, who are a fairly um, hardened group of people. 
who've often seen an awful lot before they get to the stage of being chosen to become a detective, um, they're, they're, they're a difficult group to please sometimes, and we assign them to these models, and um, they take this challenge very, very seriously. On the 19th, she comes here for whatever reason to meet somebody, the horse played to do whatever. They do whatever they're doing. It goes bad. She's beaten. Um, so may, you, maybe there is captain. Well, and that's possible. Although th this looks like you know she may have just came in to visit. So it's like real life almost. And there's a lot of little minute details which are extremely important in in, uh, in any investigation, especially a homicide investigation. I gave it some thought, and I sort of think that the nutshells were was the CSI of, of 1937, and. Uh, Quite frankly, I wish we had somebody to, to could do these and we had the time and effort and energy to put it into each and every scene because they're so valuable. Francisco Sterling was born in 1878. She lived in this house until she got married at age 19, and um, she died in 1962. Frances was the heir to the international harvester fortune. She was one of two children. She had a brother who was allowed to go on to school at Harvard. She was not allowed to go to school because she was protected, and she had private tutors, and her father did not want her to go to college. But her brother had the opportunity to go to Harvard, would bring a friend home who was Dr. I guess McGrath, and would sit around and talk about what was going on and what wasn't going on in terms of death investigation and people literally getting away with murder. So that's why she decided, and she had the means and I guess the fortitude to make a difference. Because of her being raised in a privileged, wealthy environment, she had learned the art of creating miniatures. And she took that amazing ability and put it into crime investigation. She would go out to the morgues and ride alongs with police officers, so she understood decomposition and all the colors needed <laughs> to, to make a doll look dead. So then she would decide how she would kill each one. She'd stab or shoot or hang or, you know, whatever it was. Now, she had the carpenter build everything. They had working doors, working locks, little tiny keys. She would knit socks on straight pins, which is a feat. In one, which was burnt cabin, she actually built this whole beautiful cabin and then blowtorched it to get it incinerated. I think it's very sad that her history has been lost. And I think in part it is because she was female and she wasn't taken as seriously. She's creating dollhouses. I think she was easily dismissed for that reason. And yet she was the first female member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, which is the leading forensic science organization in the world. She was the first woman to be invited into the International Chiefs of Police Association. She was made an honorary captain in the New Hampshire State Police. I mean, she, she took her money and put it into helping police officers become better and, and bringing attention to the medical examiner system and how important it was for death investigators to be trained medically. Around the boarding house, Maggie Wilson had a reputation as a free-spirited entrepreneur, despite having severe epilepsy. On the night she died, her neighbor Lizzie heard Maggie entertaining gentlemen callers. The sound of running water in their shared bathroom kept Lizzie awake. When she finally got up to shut it off, Lizzie found Maggie, <laughs> no longer the life of the party. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the dinner part of the program. The most important part about this whole process is remembering the people that made the Harvard Associates in Police Science possible. It started with Francis Glesner Lee. She was prepared to, to provide police with something that nobody else had considered they needed. Nobody else was prepared to or had the resources to give them at that particular time, really endeared her completely to the law enforcement agencies. And I'd like to pose a toast to all of those who came before us in the Harvard Associates in Police Science. Francis Glesner Lee and everybody else. 
being a woman back in the 30s, where very few women actually got into the detective branches, and the glass ceiling was very, very much lower and thicker than it is now. That just, I think, really indicates the magnitude of respect that she received from the law enforcement agencies. She should be known as the patron saint of forensic medicine, of forensic science as we know it today, because, again, I I'm not, there was nothing going on. There might have been stuff going on in Europe, but there truly was nothing going on in the States as we know what a medical examiner is now. I think the nutshell studies are very symbolic to the story of Fanny Glessner's life. Most of her time was spent modeling herself into sort of the feminine role of mother, daughter, granddaughter. And I almost wonder if going into forensics and science and death was sort of a reaction, um, a revolt against the life that she was forced to lead in her younger years. Here at the museum, we see her as a child who had a wonderful life. In her later years, she wrote a letter describing her life as lonely and quite terrifying. Did she feel like she never met up to the expectations of others? Was she just unhappy because she wanted to live more in the realm of men? We may never know the answers to that. Here's a woman who today, in my mind, unquestionably would have been a detective who wasn't allowed to go to college, who wasn't allowed to get a degree, who wasn't, you know, that it wasn't seemingly work for a woman to be involved with, with crime and bodies and everything. And so, you know, maybe in that kind of, you know, classic Chicago Midwestern, you know, good, you know, kind of buck up kind of an attitude, she kind of sucked all that frustration down into a nasty little ball and she made it into these horrifying little miniatures. While her bunt cake was cooling, Robin Barnes started to kill herself. She made the kitchen airtight by stuffing newspaper in the door cracks, turned on the gas stove, and waited. She'd been depressed for a long time, according to her husband, Fred. Curious how Robin committed suicide in the middle of making dinner. What Francis Glessner Lee created in you know the 1930s were these amazing dioramas of, of crime scenes um, but in a way she didn't create these scenarios so that detectives could look at them to solve them but more to try and sharpen their skills at trying to determine what happened you know you had to really look at these subtle clues and not just take the scenario for what it immediately looked like and a lot of police officers told her that they had become better investigators as a result of being forced to really think their way through these studies. It's amazing the detail that was used with blood spatter, uh, with newspapers, with knives, the way the bodies would lay. It's amazing that that was able to be accomplished some 70 years ago and be relevant today. There's a darkness to it. You're, you're looking into the, the soul of a crime scene. You can see the blood. You can see the footprints through the blood. You can see shell casings on the floor. Yeah, sure, it's low-tech because she was dealing with the, you know, the tools of the 1930s and 40s and, and, and the techniques of those times. But what it really forces you to understand is the relationship between interpretation and behavior. And each one of those nutshell studies tells a little story of human interaction. And that's really, I think, the basis of all crime is human interaction. Charlie Logan worked long hours at the box factory. When he came home, he was often drunk and looking for a fight. On the worst nights, his wife Caroline persuaded Charlie to sleep it off alone. Caroline told investigators that shortly after Charlie went to bed, she heard movement and then a shot. She ran upstairs and found the gun, the string, and her dead husband. First, a Y-shaped incision. Diagonal right, diagonal left, then down. Pull away the muscles to reveal the rib cage and abdominal cavity. Visible Proof's Forensic Views of the Body is an exhibition at the National Library of Medicine. The exhibition provides a lot of applied science and medicine in solving criminal cases. The nutshell studies have been borrowed from the Maryland Chief Medical Examiner's Office. Uh, they have the 18 uh, nutshell studies, and we borrowed four of them. 
The public doesn't have access to the nutshells on a regular basis. However, National Library of Medicine is a public building. Therefore, general public can come in, and while they visit the visible proofs, they get to see these very unique crime scenes in miniature size. They see miniature things that's familiar to a dollhouse, and once it registers that what they're seeing isn't pretty dolls, they actually take a double take. Most people are drawn to the nutshells. As soon as I point them in the direction of them, they're immediately off trying to figure out how the person died in each scene. Dollhouses in their form always represent that kind of innocence that comes with some kind of domestic scene of the home. But what is always lurking in any kind of question of innocence is, of course, some dark specter. Traditionally, dollhouses are idealized. And when you represent the complete antithesis of it in, in the same form, it's extremely disturbing. I mean, <laughs> it's like instead of like, you know, Malibu Barbie and Ken, you've got, you know, dead Malibu Barbie and, uh, you know, some and Ken with a shotgun. I mean, it's like it's, it's, it's really it's kind of messed up and weird. What Francis Glessner Lee successfully did was, in fact, expose what is the supposed domestic tranquility for what it really is, which is uh, fraught with scenes of violence and death and suicide. We have a culture that thrives on romantic notions and fairy tales and the hope that things will one day be perfect. And as a result, people get complacent and feel as if they'll be safe. And inside the dream, supposedly, is where it's safe. So people marry somebody they think is going to be the ultimate guardian or the person who will make everything perfect and safe and wonderful. And But when somebody gets murdered, the spouse is always the first person. They always look for the domestic partner first in terms of, well, where were you? You know, and where were you that night and what were you doing? And, you know, um, because, again, I think what we saw in a lot of these models, it happened at home. It happened to women. It happened in places where they should be secure and safe, and they're not. All of the women are living lives of quiet desperation in some way. I think that perhaps it was Francis Glessner Lee's way of trying to change the perspective especially realizing that this is a field dominated by men um, and that it probably would be for decades to come. I think that she purposefully put a focus on women and perhaps challenged the way that the people that would view these nutshells think about women. Yeah, I really hope that she was as subversive as I am thinking that she was. Dorothy Dennison never gave her mother a moment's worry. So when the high school student didn't return home from the market, her mother knew something was wrong. The last known person to see Dorothy alive was the neighborhood butcher, who sold her a pound of hamburger. Four days of hot, humid weather passed before the police found Dorothy's corpse in the parlor of a vacant parsonage. Determining her time since death, would explain much of what Dorothy cannot. The question is not whether or not murder is entertainment. It is entertainment, which is part of the thing that, that I think drives our attention with it. There is a fascination with figuring out, you know, the basis or the reasoning or the method of how one human being could take the life of another. Within usually an hour's time, the world is all in chaos and scary, and then it's all made right. There have been a lot of crime dramas on television over the years, and I think one of the things that made CSI unique was the focus on the criminalists, the forensic investigators, the, the lab geeks, you know, who, who actually do the analysis and collect the evidence. Um, that was a different focus for television. Conventionally, most crime dramas had focused on police and detectives or beat cops or whatever it was. And, and this was really a show about scientists and science. And it was done with visual effects that took you into places that you hadn't seen before. 
That combination of ingredients resulted in one of the most successful television franchises in history. The detail is terrifying. I think Malibu Barbie did it. Well, then there's a lot more to Barbie than just a pretty face, because this is a perfect half-inch scale model of the room. Three different views of the same dead doll. In season seven, we wanted to try something different. We wanted to have a storyline that arced across the entire season. We finally hit upon a way to do that, and that was with what we eventually ended up calling the miniature serial killer, which was a killer that leaves a miniature of a crime scene at an actual crime scene. The inspiration for this came from a nutshell study. The fans really loved this story. It just had, it had a very special feel to it. It was something that people had never seen before. CSI is obviously a show that revolves very tightly around science. All of the techniques you see on the show are real. The instrumentation in our lab, most of it is actually working. We have one of the best equipped crime labs in the country, sadly, on our fictional sets. With all the science, CSI looks really good on TV. I don't know of any one state crime lab or county crime lab will have all those bells and whistles. The science is good. It's not junk science, but I don't think any of us possess those toys in order to carry out the job that they do, especially in a time. I mean, I've seen tox results come in during a commercial break. You know, they were still out in the field and they're getting results. It does not happen in life. We're telling a dramatic story in 45 minutes of program time and, you know, the thing that we compress into that amount of time could be six months to a year of analysis and data collection and evidence collection. Um, you know, that's just television. It's not like CSI. I wish it was. I wish they gave us hummers and let us wear cool clothes all the time, but it's very messy. Where people are like, well, didn't you get that DNA? Isn't it done yet? They don't understand that it could take three, six, nine months up the road to get some of that evidence back. Of course, we're not all as good looking as who they have on TV. Our social lives aren't quite as exciting as theirs. And the cases don't get done in quite the perfect manner that they get done. Frank Harris was unconscious and smelled of liquor when he was spotted by a police officer. The wagon picked Frank up and took him to jail where he was left alone for the night. By morning, Frank was dead. Was it an accident or murder? Now, this is the, uh, the famous murder board. Now, these are all the murders that each squad has gotten throughout the year. And the way this breaks up is the red, any, any name that you see written in red here, those are open cases. The black names are cases that have been solved, and we have an arrest in those cases. The blue ones are officer involved, meaning these were homicides by the police, um, generally because, the, you know, the officers had to take uh, deadly force action. And as a result, the subject died. Anywhere you see a badge is a police officer that was killed. So we've only had one this year, thank God. Every day I come and stand in front of this board. <laughs> My partners stand in front of this board and we look at it and you run everything through your head, every possibility through your head. Um, the, the men and women in this unit have lost time with their families. They've missed birthdays, they've missed holidays, they've missed a lot of important events in their families' lives because this is so important. Basically what we know now so far is that he's a white male, 54 years old, and he's an IV drug user. That's a possibility of the cause of his death. Hanging up 
Juries expect you to do what CSI does. They expect you to find a spot of blood on a car that was left at the airport three weeks ago because you found a lead that said the left rear tire of this car with its tread had to have come from a rental car. In reality, those leads drive away and sometimes you never discover them. It has been, you know, often portrayed as a negative thing that we, you know, that, that people see something on the show and suddenly they're expecting prosecutors um, to assemble, you know, to, to analyze every hair and fiber and print every surface and sample everything for DNA and have it all ready and that we are generating a demand for an unreasonable amount of evidence and analysis. I've heard that. Uh, you know, I've heard, you know, the, the flip side, which is that, you know, at least people understand these things. Like, we're not back in the O.J. Simpson trial days where, like, you had to, you know, spend, you know, days and days and days educating people on what DNA was and why it was valuable. The negative spin is what you often hear from attorneys because what they think has happened is that the television shows like CSI have miseducated lay people who then get on juries and make poor decisions um, and, and acquit people more often because of reasonable doubt. For example, I do know of a case where the jury acquitted because the detectives didn't fingerprint the grass. And that's just stupid people associate science with truth. So they're expecting you to be able to do a lot more than you might be able to do because you're using science. It is very important and uh, it can answer a lot of questions, but it's not, it's not everything for us. But the other part of that, the positive spin, is that while they're not really getting the real story on these shows, in fact, they're sitting and listening to the experts in ways they never used to do. They would go to sleep when the scientists took the stand, like, because I don't understand that language. Now they do. So now they listen. In my opinion, people have tendency to believe what they see on television, but in reality, to get any result, you know, for DNA, anything, it can take weeks and sometimes even months, depending from state to state or laboratory to laboratory. There are many cases where, you know, if you, if you get to the top of the heap, you know, you can get a good DNA result in 18 hours. It's more of a question of, of the actual laboratory backlog than anything else. That's why it takes six months. Attorneys are asking for more testing than they even need because the juries demand it. And juries think DNA is in every crime scene. It's in about 10 to 15 percent. Usable DNA is in about 10 to 15 percent of crime scenes. If you didn't process or DNA or you didn't bring it into the trial, they may translate that into reasonable doubt. This whole body of science is only as good as the lowliest person who's, who's doing it either collecting the evidence from the field, the lab bench worker who's processing it, and that if that kind of stuff is misused or not done appropriately, they can all wind up being perfect crimes. Marion and Arthur were married, only not to each other. Hideaway was their secret rendezvous until the day Arthur was killed by a single shot. Marion told police that Arthur announced their affair was over. There was no heartbreak, no argument. Arthur simply bent down to pick up his cigarettes, and his gun accidentally went off. It took the police several days of searching the cabin before they found the bullet. So a show like CSI will be understood not in terms of, say, murder or dead bodies, as much as justice is being done. And that's what makes, I think, a show like that so, so palatable, which is to say, if CSI suddenly changed all of its scripts where none of the murders were solved, in fact, every case was left open-ended, and they would say, well, we can't figure this one out. If that's what the show did, I, I think that people would just be irate. I see death investigation kinds of, of movies, television shows, novels, true crime, as giving us a frame for getting close to something that scares us that seems amorphous, that we don't know a whole lot about. But this is a way for us to come close to the body and touch it in a way. And it, but it's within a frame that we can always put down or, you know, turn off or walk away from if it gets to be too much. And I think that's why we, we use literature and film as a mediating factor between us and what's scary. We turn death into monsters. We turn death into investigation shows. These are all things that help us deal with what is essentially a frightening, unknown process.
behind every single person that comes in here, there is usually a group of friends, family, um, who have now suffered a significant loss. And so it's not just, there's not just one victim. The victim is in fact a group of people. Anything in any county in Maryland, we have to deal with it. So, you know, even things that we hear about on the internet or on the news and things like that, most of us, we don't watch the news because we know we're gonna see the news once we get to work. We have answers to a deceased person of why he or she may have died. But um, reasoning, we have, we have no reasoning for the violence that people inflict on one another. And I know there's a lot of family members who, who think about and they wonder what is autopsies really like? Do they really be cutting people up? Yes, we cut them, but it is for medical reasons. It's not just because we enjoy doing it. We do it so we can help them to understand what it was that, that may have taken their loved one from them. I mean, there's days that, that are very hard. I think probably the child death scenes are the hardest ones to deal with or the really brutal murders. We really don't like talking about our jobs once we leave work because once you leave work, you want to leave any sorrow that may have happened the night before or the day of. We want to leave all that stuff here because if you take that stuff out and you start to hold it, it can really break you down and make you into a, a very sentimental type of person, meaning you'll walk around and start crying about everything. I just ask God to watch over all of the souls that are here and hopefully we can make sense of what we may walk into today. You know, we can answer some of those, those unanswered questions. We can make some things that really aren't there for, for in, in plain sight for people to see and hear and understand. We can make that stuff visible and, 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 and just, just paint a, a one big vivid picture so those who don't know will know. I've been a detective for over 12 years. Someone takes someone's life. I'm that person's last voice and to bring closure to that family. A young lady had come from California. She had messed up some of the drug transactions, stolen money, things like that from the gang, and they brutally killed her. They hit her in the head with a cinder block, crushed her, jumped on her head, um, stabbed her like 37 times. I mean, it was, let me sh show you some of the pictures at the scene. These are some of the footprints that we saw in the blood. She was laying like this when we got there. She was beat terribly. I mean, these are bruise marks from, from them kicking her. These are stab wounds. A lot of times you can't answer the why question and it's just left out there. But you wonder, I mean, I talk to my friends, my colleagues, and why anybody would do this to anybody. You know, they wonder this, you know, you wonder this, everybody wonders this. And there's not a rhyme or reason why they do it and there's no answer out there. I try to name my investigations after the victim. We have a tendency to name them after our accused because that's who we're constantly dealing with. But they get lost and the victims are the most important part of it. She died in a room where no one had bothered to change the calendar in five years. The room was registered the previous evening under the names Mr. and Mrs. John Smith. Mr. Smith left the next morning, specifically requesting that the staff not disturb his wife. At 3 p.m., the rooming house maid tried several times to wake the woman. But Mrs. Smith wouldn't be checking out at all. Welcome to the Anthropological Research Facility, um, otherwise known as the Body Farm. You just want to watch your step and walk over this. Every piece of plastic that you see is actually a donation. Currently, we have 180 bodies out here in various states of uh, decomposition or locations. We needed a place where we could study rates of decomposition in a certain environment under different conditions to help establish something called time since death, a framework, because in, in a, a criminal case, it could break someone's alibi by having a scientific way of establishing when this person probably had died. We do predominantly place individuals on the surface, but we also place people in burials. We will place people to mimic cases. 
So that means we will place people in a trash can, we will place people in a trunk of a car. The only thing that we will not do is we do not inflict any type of harm beyond all that was already committed on that individual, uh, which means that we do not shoot people up, we do not cut them up. Uh, unfortunately, we receive enough donations that those things already occur to them that we don't need to do that and see the damages or the effects that it has on decomposition. The FBI trained there, entomologists who study insects trained there, dog handlers trained there. It's, it's an amazing place and was a result of a visionary, Bill Bass, who really saw the need for it because he made such a huge mistake on one of his cases, missed it by 100 years, and he recognized we need to study this with scientific studies with controlled conditions. Dr. Bass is considered one of the grandfathers of forensic anthropology. When we first started and first opened, people referred to it as the Bass Anthropological Research Facility after Dr. Bass. But unfortunately, the, uh, the acronym is BARF, and you do not want a facility that we, like we have uh, named BARF. So uh, it was called ARF, and a lot of our students now call it the ARF. Um, but it's known most to, the, to most people as the body farm. Between our work at the facility and our skeletal collection, we have at any given time over 800 individuals that are being used in research. The angulation of this, um, because it's actually going downward, and the likelihood of it being uh, self-inflicted uh, is very limited. So it's a better chance this was a homicide. Now, if you compare that to something like this, um, on this individual, uh, you can all, you again see an entrance wound where it has really clean edges uh, and radiating fractures. And then compare it to over here, you actually have a nice exit wound uh, with the radiating fractures and the beveling. Uh, but something like this, where you have a side shot, like on the side of the head, is more typical um, of a self-inflicted uh, or a suicide instance. I don't want to come across as some horrible person, but I, I do find, especially in the decaying process, a great amount of beauty in decomposing remains. The only aspect that I don't see a sense of beauty in is my work with homicides or uh, those types of deaths. Um, but to me, the natural aspect of things is the most beautiful. We do get complaints and we do get people that call us and they tell us that we are going against the proper values and the traditional burial rites and, um, and, and telling me that I'm this horrible person. And I let them go through their, their spiel. I let them tell me what they believe and I'll just say, well, thank you very much. And, and that'll be the end of it. But we do tell people that the people that donate to our program chose this for themselves or their family chose this. And so if you want to respect anything, you should respect their wishes uh, and honor their wishes to donate. It's all in the pursuit of justice to make sure the right people are convicted and the right people are cleared. That's the point. And without visionaries who put very solid processes in place that are reliable and valid, we would still have a lot of people just relying on their opinions or on junk science. And that's how innocent people get convicted and guilty people don't get convicted. There's so much to learn from a decomposing body and all of the things that go along with that body. Just like what uh, Captain Lee was trying to show people and demonstrate that there's so many little things that are involved in a, a, a scene that could aid in the investigation and if you approached it in a, a certain way you could really enhance your investigation, if not change the, the answers that you got from it. It was the day before Christmas, and Jesse Compton's back door was wide open. At 6 a.m., Harry the milkman entered and searched the home out of concern for the elderly woman. In the attic, he found where Mrs. Compton hung her clothes to dry. Only this time, she was still in them. Love letters were scattered on the floor. It was 6.43 before Harry phoned the police.
I teach a class called Psychological Sleuthing. And as part of this class, the students reproduce one of the, uh, Francis Glessner Lee's Dollhouses of Death, or Nutshell Studies, in the attic of a building we call Tucker House on campus. We're going to always photograph the scene before we collect any evidence. We're going to take four corners of the room. Ideally, if we're outside, uh, we want to take each side of the building, OK? The black lights, uh, we're going to have saliva on the envelopes, so we're going to check that um, for that for, for any remnants of that. Uh, also we will then have an investigative class come in and try to process the scene, and we'll have other students in my class go in and try to profile the behavioral evidence of the scene, and that way they get a hands-on experience of what it's like to really have to think through what is involved in a death scene and where do they look for evidence and how do they go about processing that. And then it says as he's coming home, the thought of you turns my stomach even now. When I return, do not call for me, and I hope your presence will never again darken my doorstep, for I will not be found upon yours. And it says farewell instead of love, like all the other ones say. So what happened exactly? Why the sudden change of heart? No. I'm very happy that there's been so much attention paid to forensics because it does bring in a lot more interest and so you have a larger pool of students from which to find really the best type of investigators. I find that the four-year programs and then into graduate school winnow out the students who really just want to dress cool and, and, and be like CSI as opposed to those who are genuinely serious about a, a career in forensics or in investigation. So I think it's great because we get a lot of interest but uh, we do find a lot of students kind of fall away. I actually had one student who thought she wanted to be a profiler, and the first time she saw a crime scene photo, she just about fainted and said she'd rather work in a Dairy Queen. <laughs> it is becoming harder and harder for students to get into programs. And then the students that get into the programs are students that are here because forensics is cool, not because it's science. And that's something that is really trying for those of us that were truly interested in forensics, especially before the rise of CSI. They see very sexy, glamorous, glitzy, high action shows, movies, and television, and they think that's what it is. But in fact, there are no positions like what they depict on CSI. There are none. Well, see, it looked to me like there's an elderly woman reading old love letters and getting depressed and just hanging herself with their clothes on you. I think that's what happened. I don't think so, because in another letter it said that he had a small token of his love, which I came to assume that was the little doll over there. And also there was a muddy boot print that was facing the opposite direction of her, okay. the way she was hanging. The way the ligature marks on her neck were didn't match the way the rope was hanging around her neck. And it's hard to strangle yourself and then hang yourself. So. Did anybody notice that there were two different handwritings in the letter? Uh, I didn't look that closely. Ah, <laughs> uh, OK. Yeah, that was a clue. I actually wanted to do forensic science before CSI even started and I'm actually going on to get a master's in forensic toxicology so I'm not going to be out on the crime scene I'm going to be in the lab which isn't that glamorous but it's definitely what I enjoy doing and plus it's not really glamorous when you like have to deal with families there's a lot of like the emotional like he, like humanitarian aspect of dealing with like the survivors of a crime and like the victims hopefully I'm gonna go to law school but um, I'd also if not I'd like to become a detective so I mean this is right up my alley like I really enjoy doing this kind of stuff Evan Wallace was prone to histrionics. Whenever things didn't go his way, he'd storm out to the barn, stand on an overturned bucket with a noose around his neck, and threaten to jump. His wife, Arvella, always talked him down. Except on the day she didn't. Was Evan Wallace just an accident waiting to happen? Or perhaps Arvella thought that it would be easier living with the money from Evan's insurance policy than living with Evan. presumed that he couldn't find the pail, which was hidden around the back of the barn, and somebody had moved it back there to, to water the animals. So he used the packing case instead, which broke under his weight. And he ended up being successful in his uh, suicide or parasuicide. Uh, if you want to go with the wife theory, it's the wife could have hidden the bucket around the back, and then picked an argument with the husband knowing what he would do. And or it could be a true accident. Although if you put yourself in harm's way and you're successful, you do have to take responsibility for that to some degree. So there are so many different ways um, that you look for. Now you're, you're going to try and decide which of those particular scenarios will allow you to get as close to the truth as humanly possible. There's a door right, this, there's a door over here and there's a little foyer and on the other side of the foyer there's a main entrance and there's a slot over there for the mail to come in 
and there's six pieces of mail on the floor. And as you come into the room, you can see there's two chairs that are covered, and there's two lamps, one here, one here, and both have shades on and also covered with some sort of cloth and tied. Two windows in the house, they're both locked with shutters that are also closed. Uh, there's two chairs, one here, and there's another chair around here with a piano and a little stool in front of the piano. And in front of that is the victim, a teenager by the name of Dorothy Denson. She has, as you can see, a stab wound in the left side of the stomach, abdomen area. And also on the right side of the head, there's also some sort of blunt force trauma. Her dress, the upper part, the chest is, the chest is being exposed, and also the dress is lifted up, exposing her right leg by the thigh area. She has some sort of abrasion scratches on her face, her chest area, and leg. There's also a purse over here with a package of meat which she went to buy. Behind the chair over here, there's also a hammer and a little blood on the head of the hammer. So the statement says that on August 19th, uh, the victim, Dorothy, left her house uh, at around 11 o'clock to per go to the market and purchase some uh, steak for the dinner. Girl doesn't show up, the mom gets concerned, she calls a neighbor. The neighbor says, I saw Dorothy walking towards the market. The individual who owns the uh, steak place, the marketplace, says, I did, uh, Dorothy was here, I sold her a pound of meat at approximately 12 o'clock in the afternoon. The police was called at approximately 5.40 uh, on that day by the mother. And once the police got the call, they, they started the investigation. And on August 21st, they searched all abandoned property in that vicinity and nothing. And on August 23rd, she was discovered over here. Also, just to mention, by the meat, there are some flies. And on the victim, there's no flies, no decomp. It doesn't look like there's any lividity being set. There's no marks on the uh, wrist to show that maybe she was being held captive anywhere. There's a large amount of blood underneath her head. And on, on the uh, knife where she was stabbed, no blood. three-room dwelling consists of a kitchen and two bedrooms. In the adult bedroom, there is a woman on the bed and a man lying on a floor on blankets. Blood all around them, blood splatter on the wall. Furniture turned over. Blood here, blood here, footprints leading to there. there well, how does the gun wind up in the kitchen and he winds up here? Assuming that the male is the shooter, it could be the female, but... Could be. Now, that's a round right there under yeah. the chair, okay? So if the person's standing here, he fires, hits her. Right. But there's definitely, whatever round was used over there, is the same shell casing that's here, under the chair. You go in the child's room, there's a baby in a crib. Again, blood splatter against the wall. Some stuff turned over. It would appear that there's an open window on the porch into the baby's bedroom. And the chair's knocked over. The chair's knocked well. over. All right, so let's look at signs of struggle. Definitely there, definitely here. You go into the kitchen, and then there's a, there's a rifle laying on the floor, and then there's these ponding, the, uh, puddling of blood in different locations, and there's smears as it looks somebody might have been dragged through, you know, the house. All the blood is right up there where the head would have been in the bed. Then there's blood that runs down there to the floor. The pillow is in the corner. Yeah, there's no splatter. And there's no splatter on that I mean, pillow. there's minor stuff. Very right minor. It looks like the wound pattern on the female is all facial, right? Yeah. I don't see anything below her head. Yeah. What's interesting is there's a flashlight on this night table, too. Mm -hmm. And there's no lights on in the house. What's he got on his he's feet? His does he have blood on his feet from these footprints? No, it doesn't appear to be. Well, yeah, he does. There's right some on his... Uh, on the tip of his toes and his... Left heel here. There's blood. Come over here on this side of the front door. I can't tell if that's a pry mark right there. But if they were in here, they would have already been inside. See the door? How it's... Oh, yeah. Here's what we got, right? We have two open windows, mm -hmm. one of which looks like a sign of a struggle. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a round was fired in this room. There's a shell casing mm -hmm. that's been discharged. Then we have another sign of blood 
and drag marks from this area. Somebody's definitely wounded there, mm -hmm. and most likely the shooter of that child. Mm -hmm. Why would a burglar want to kill a child? I agree with you wholeheartedly, but again, we don't know the circumstances behind this marriage. Maybe this isn't even his child. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But, you know, none of the drawers are open. Nothing's really ransacked to indicate somebody tried to steal anything. The kitchen cabinets are closed. It's neat and orderly, given what happened here. Let me see the sink. I want to make sure nobody there's, 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 there's no blood There's no blood in the sink. Mm -hmm. The right. towel looks like it was left as it was probably the night before or after they did dishes. Well, what we'll do is we'll get the EDU up here, the emergency unit, and we'll take the J-trap out of the sink and save whatever water's in there, and that could possibly hold some blood in it. DNA. Good call. Excellent idea. Just to make sure nobody tried. I think that they're wonderful. You have to be open to possibility. Uh, it could be a murder, it could be a suicide, uh, it could be an accidental death. And as investigators, you constantly have to keep your, your mindset open to all the possibilities. And when you look at those, there, there's, even with the brief scenario you get, there's so many issues you have to be alive to, and, and, and they give you a reason to pause and examine everything carefully. And that's, that's the key thing in doing an investigation is, while it's a murder, you have to take your time. If you rush through it, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes anyway. But you have to sit back. You have to take your time. You have to be methodical. And these kind of scenarios, the nutshells, give you a chance to stare at it and be methodical. To me, it's just the, the detail-oriented nature that just makes it really beautiful pieces of art. Because it, that is what it is. It, it's a piece of art that it goes above and beyond anything that you would, you would think of. It is so unexpected that we can't help but just keep looking at it because it just doesn't make any sense to us. It is death and, and it's something we don't really want to be involved in our life. But we like to peek at it. It's like an accident as you go by and everybody slows down on the road. We're all little voyeurs at heart, you know? It's rare really today to see a person devote so much to a cause that you could tell the passion she had for really speaking for the dead. And I think that's, it's commendable, absolutely commendable. We don't want to dwell on the notion of our own end and trying to understand how people come to an end through fiction, maybe it gets our heads wrapped around it a little bit in a way that we can understand it. And maybe it's an object lesson in how not to live your life. Um, I'm not sure, but it absolutely has, you know, taps into I think very deep currents of the human psyche because it clearly has an enduring appeal. We may never shake the need to know why Dorothy went into the vacant house on her way home, or what kind of madness found its way into the Judson's home on Halloween night. Stories of perfect crimes and getting away with murder are not the bedtime stories we like to hear. But perhaps the nutshell studies of unexplained death actually explain more than we want to know. The dead are talking. We just don't like what they have to say.